Welcome back to Monday Musings, a casual conversation about culture and theology. I'm Justin Ely. And I'm Daniel Chen. We're just a couple guys talking about some stuff. We are two pastors talking about life from a biblical worldview, and we're starting a new series today called Ologies. Or uh, Ologies. Ologies, if it's a soft, soft G. G. Yeah. Uh, ologies, uh, coming from uh, ology, meaning the study of. And so uh, we're going to talk through basically systematic theology. Right. Um, so different uh, parts of Scripture. So like today we're going to talk about bibliology, which is the study of the Bible, the study right. of Scripture. We're going to talk about theology, the study of God, uh, harmatology, the study of sin, anthropology, the study of man, and so on. So yeah. this will be a multi-part series kind of taking you through systematic theology, and it's meant to be mainly a broad overview of what does the Bible teach about X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I think it's helpful in, in terms of, you know, if you're really any Christian, but especially if you're a newer Christian, and you're sure. asking the question, what do I need to know as a Christian? Yeah. Honestly, I, I hope, hopefully, this the point of this series is, well, we'll I let hope, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope you leave being like, oh, this is what I need to know. This yeah. is what I can study, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can study theology by just reading through the Bible, which you should, right? Every Christian should yep. do this. Uh, but then you can also study it in terms of concepts. Yes. Or a system. Yep. Right? That's why it's called systematic theology. And we should really be doing both. Yep. Um, because if you study, for example, you know, we're going to talk about the study of the Bible today. Mm-hmm. Well, there's many places in the Bible where it talks about itself. Sure. And But if you start with reading Genesis 1... It's going to take forever for you to get to each of those verses, whereas right. you can just do a study on just those verses yep. and get to know more about the Bible or about sin or about the Holy Spirit or about, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Um, so hopefully this will be a really, really helpful podcast for, for our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, kind of two sources we're going to be using. Uh, one is our Christ Fellowship Church Statement of Faith. We're going to uh, use that a lot. And we're also going to use this book, uh, Christian Theology, The Biblical Story and Our Faith by Christopher Morgan. And I um, haven't read the whole thing, but uh, Aaron Minnikoff, the pastor of Mount Vernon, Baptist, gave it to me. So, you, you know, know it's five stars. stars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, it's funny. He's, so, he's a good friend of our church, but he was also my history of christianity t- professor at rts yeah and then years later i was like oh hey hey and so but I, I just you know wanted to give him the the props that he deserves that he, he you can trust the guy you know he's aaron a seminary professor aaron Menikoff is a great man he is a great he's man. a great man he's a great pastor and he's become a great friend so i'm very grateful for him today we're talking about bibliology uh, so this is the study of the Bible, or uh, you know, the study of the Scriptures. I want to read from our Christ Fellowship Church statement of faith um, on the statement of the Scriptures. We say we accept the Bible, the 39 books of the Old Testament, and the 27 books of the New Testament as the written Word of God. The Bible is the only essential and infallible record of God's self-disclosure to mankind. It leads us to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ— Being given by God, the scriptures are both fully and verbally inspired by God. Therefore, as originally given, the Bible is free of error in all that it teaches. Each book is to be interpreted according to its context and purpose and in reverent obedience to the Lord, who speaks through it in living power. All believers are exhorted to study the scriptures and diligently apply them to their lives. The scriptures are the authoritative and normative rule and guide of all Christian life, practice, and doctrine. They are totally sufficient and must not be added to, superseded, or changed by later tradition, extra-biblical revelation, or worldly wisdom. Every doctrinal formulation, whether of creed, confession, or theology, must be put to the test of the full counsel of God in Holy Scripture. And thanks for joining us for Monday Musings. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that sums it up, right? And a lot of the, what we're going to talk about uh, we also covered in the canons, creeds, and confession we did. section, so maybe go back to the canon piece. But a few things to highlight from our statement of faith, right? The Scriptures, the Bible, is the 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament. Yeah. So 66 books, that's the Scripture. It's the written Word of God. Hmm. It's infallible. 
um, and we'll, we'll get into some of these a little later. <laughs> um, it's inspired. It's inerrant. Um, we should interpret it in context. Um, it's the authoritative and normative ruling guide of all Christian life practice and doctrine, meaning the scriptures guide your life and doctrine, not the latest Christian book, right? You know, or anything else. Um, it is interesting that um, it, w- our statement says the Bible is the only essential and infallible record of God's self-disclosure to mankind. So notice the only essential and infallible. There's also natural revelation, like we learn about God from waking up in the morning and seeing the sunrise. Right. But it's it's not uh, our interpretation of that is not infallible. Correct. So the we we can learn something about God from natural revelation, but that's not enough to save us. We we need the scriptures um, to really know who God is. Right. Um, so we want to get into um, kind of related to this book, Christian Theology. Uh, Christopher Morgan uh, points out um, seven things about Scripture, right? Scripture's inspired. It's God's Word. It's authoritative. It's inerrant. It's sufficient. It's clear. And it's beneficial. Um, so, and if you wanted to do a study on the Bible— these just these categories you can even break down even further, right? So you could do a study on each of one of these subcategories essentially, and as you study these things, you're going to end with a really robust view of the scriptures. And yeah. so we're going to give you an overview. We're not going to dive super deep into each one of these, but in your own study, we we just encourage you as you think about growing in your faith. These are all different aspects in which you could grow. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so first, uh, Scripture is inspired. Um, we think of Second Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is breathed out by God. We think of Second Peter one twenty one. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Scripture is God breathed, and yet at the same time, it reflects the personalities of the human authors. They do that that wrote it and. Uh, Christopher Morgan points out that th- this is called concursus and confluence, uh, that the, the authorship of Scripture, it's like two rivers running together to become one. Mm. And so who wrote the Bible? The Holy Spirit did. But also John wrote John, and Mark wrote Mark, and yeah. Luke wrote Luke, and they write differently than each other. And that was in itself planned by God. Like God did not create zombies that, you know, mechanically right. dictated exactly what he said. He he worked through the personalities of the authors, and yet it's God-breathed. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it goes back to what you know we talked about in the Canons, Creeds, and Confessions, but I love to just to think about how Jesus was fully God and fully man while right. in his time on earth here. Yep. And honestly, that's that's out of our realm of logic. In understanding mm-hmm. how to actually fully grasp that, mm-hmm. and the Bible to me, as I think about Christ in uh, who He is, it ma- it gives me some peace to know. Okay, the Scripture is similar in the same way; it is fully written by man, right? Yep. But it's also fully written by God. That that um, paradigm is helpful in both. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I just think. Uh, You know, we know who Jesus is through the Word, but if we trust in Jesus, we can trust the Word in the same way, right? Right. And and that that paradigm has been really helpful for me to understand the inspiration and 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 how it could work. I I think anecdotally too, as you read it, there are just some things in there that, like, I feel like you know, the Bible always talks about how sinful humans are. Sure. Why would a human write that? Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. unless it was telling the story on how to be saved from that. Yeah. Right? This redemptive arc through through the scripture leading to Christ. Uh, and like, you know, all other religions, for example, talk about this is what you need to do. Mm-hmm. And maybe if you do enough of that thing, God will you save you. You can get some, right. some paradise post-death kind of, yeah. Every religion except for Christianity. Yep. And it's like, I don't know, there's just, as you read it, 
And as you really read it, there are just things that are, make you think, wow, this is, this is not, this is written by a human, but this is not written by a human. Uh, who was I don't it? know how to describe that. You, you, yeah, see, you get what I, I'm saying? I forget who was it that said, um, I read many books, but only the Bible reads me. Mm. And, you know, we're going through James in our church right now, and James has just painful and penetrating insights into the human heart. Yeah. That is just like, you just don't make this stuff up. Yeah. You you read James and you're like, yeah, nailed me, you yeah. know? And when I read Harry Potter, I don't think that, you know? <laughs> even Lord of the Rings, I don't, you know? It, yeah. And even the, the penetrating insights from Lord of the Rings are really from, from the Bible. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Bible, Scripture is inspired. Um, it is God-breathed, and yet uh, God, the Holy Spirit, works through the human authors. Um, second, Scripture is God's Word. And uh, Christopher Morgan gives four reasons why we can affirm it is God's Word. First, um, it is routinely called and equated with the Word of God. So it's the sacred writings that 2 Timothy 3.15 mentions. It's breathed out by God in 2 Timothy 3.16. It's the Word in chapter 4, verse 2, the truth uh, in verse 4. Um, so it, it's... It's called that, you know. We see this in Psalm 19, 7 to 11. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The commands of the Lord are radiant, making the light the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is abundant reward. Mm. So the scriptures call themselves the scriptures. Correct. The scriptures call themselves the, the word of God. If you read through, especially the Old Testament as well, I mean, the phrase, thus says the Lord, appears like thousands of times. Yep. It says, thus says the Lord, th- thus yep. says the Lord. Well, what do you... Yep. It's God's word. Why is it written like yep. that? Because it's God's word. Yep. These are God's word speaking. Yeah. yeah. The second thing he says is that um, God directs the writers so that Scripture is inspired by him. We kind of already talked about this, but the dynamic of verbal inspiration, it's the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit upon Scripture's human authors so that they write what God intends to communicate, uh, his truth. Uh, Third, Scripture bears characteristics of God and performs key functions for him. Uh, He mentions in Psalm 19, which we just quoted, the word of the Lord like its author is described as perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, enduring, forever, reliable, and altogether righteous. And so that's who God is. Yeah. And so his word naturally, um, you know, shows that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, uh, this is a really important concept too, because, I mean, the scriptures tell us heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will endure forever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, And so, yeah, very important. Yeah. And then this is an interesting one. Fourth reason why the Scripture is the Word of God. Uh, He points out that Jesus and the apostles attribute to God many Old Testament statements not originally attributed to him. And so uh, they cite a bunch of verses, and so he says, New Testament writers will sometimes say that God, quote, said, or the Holy Spirit says— when citing Old Testament passages in which God is not the direct um, speaker. Oh, it interesting. Might, so it, it shows that, like, yeah, they understood, even though Moses said that thing, Jesus is saying God said. Yeah. And so he's showing it. it's it's the Word of God. Um, so Scripture is uh, the Word of God. Uh, third, Scripture is authoritative. Um, because God gives Scripture, it possesses his authority. So it, it has the right to uh, teach us and correct us and rebuke us and instruct us on how to live. Yeah. And this is important in 2024, man, I almost said 2023, where <laughs> I feel like the general culture bucks against any authority and the culture, this, the postmodern culture kind of is shifting towards the ultimate authority is yourself. Yeah. And we would say No. That's a terrible way. That's like, that's going to lead down a path of destruction. Yeah. And uh, the Bible is our authority, and it's meant to be an authority that's good for us. Yeah. You know, I, I always heard, for example, imagine, you know, we used to play 
as a kid, like, uh, like tag in the dark and all this stuff. Sure. I, I always heard him like it, this analogy. Imagine if you lift, you know, by a cliff or somewhere you can like fall off of. Right. Mm-hmm. And you're playing, you know, manhunt or something in the dark. Well, if you're playing in the dark and you know, there's a cliff somewhere, you're not going to go anywhere. It's terrifying. Sure. But what's actually going to give you the freedom? If you actually build a fence yeah, so that you know you can run, 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 you can do anything. Yep. But the fence is going to stop you yep. before you fall off that cliff. Yep. Man, this is why we need a authority we can trust in our lives. Yeah. And this is what the Bible actually does for us. It doesn't actually r- restrict your freedom. It actually gives you much more freedom than the authority of God yeah. does. Yeah. It, it's um, I, I, Tim Keller used to say... Uh, if you you can't have a relationship with someone that isn't able to correct you, hmm. right? If if you if you, if your spouse can never tell you, hey, you messed up there, you don't yeah. really have a real relationship, and so you you don't have a relationship with God if He cannot correct you, right? Um, and and that's even a peer to peer relationship, not even like a Lord to servant relationship. Yeah. But how how does God correct you? The Bible, yeah, the, the scriptures. And if you, you know, it's funny, it's like uh, getting to parts of the Bible that you don't like is actually proof of its authority and inspiration. Yeah. Because it's also like, well, have you ever considered that a part of the Bible that you don't like, another culture actually really does like? Mm. So like as as modern Westerners, we get to Ephesians 5, uh Wives submit to your husbands. We're like, well, we we don't like that. That I don't want to obey that. You go to the Middle East. Husbands love your wives. Get you know, lay down your life for her, like Christ laid down his life yeah. for the church. They say, I don't, I don't like that. You know, she she's more of my property than someone I need to love. Right. Well, th- that's the amazing thing of the the Bible is it it's it's authoritative and it it corrects all cultures. It doesn't fit into one. Yeah. Um. But unless you're willing to submit to Scripture, you'll always try to force fit Scripture to fit into your culture. Yeah. And it's just not good. Yeah. You, you know, I, I even think, like, about my relationship with my children, for example. If my children were to write a rule book for our household, they'd eat ice cream for dinner. Sure. And candy whenever they wanted. And they watch TV all day. And if you, wrote, if you read that rule book, you'd be like, oh, this is written by a kid. Right. This isn't for right? your good. Yeah. How do you know it's written by adult? You can only watch TV 30 minutes a day. Yeah. Or for some of our listeners, you, zero You can have a, a snack day. at between 9 and 10 o'clock. Right. You, yeah. How do you know that? Because it's written in a way that's good for the people, even though the kids, even they though the kids it. don't like it. Yeah. Right? I think when you buck up against the thing you don't like, it's like, okay, yeah. It gives me confidence because if a human had just purely written without the authority, inspiration, word of God. Mm-hmm. I think you could easily tell, like, oh, this is someone making stuff up. For sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas you you come across something that you're like, like, God tells you do this or don't do this, and mm-hmm. you don't like that. And it actually should give you confidence. Yeah, this is this is, this has an authority above some random dude writing something. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's good. Uh, so we see that Scripture's inspired. It's God's word. It's authoritative. And fourth, it is inerrant. Uh, and that means it is without error. Uh, so, uh, for example, Second uh, Peter one twenty to twenty one. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Christopher Morgan points out, he said, God inspires the biblical writings, 2 Timothy 3.16. He uses the experiences, personalities, and thoughts of the prophets and apostles, yet he directs what they speak and write. Thus, inspiration is dynamic. God actively works through the active human authors. This inspiration is also verbal, referring to the actual writings and words, not only just the ideas, that the prophet spoke, and it is plenary or full, as God inspires all Scripture, not merely parts of it. He said the result is that Scripture is inerrant, truthful in all that it affirms. So it's almost like inspiration results in inerrancy. 
because verbal plenary inspiration the words all of it inspired by god god cannot lie therefore it is without error yeah yeah and it makes a lot of sense right if if god is perfect right if right. god is without his word error, should yeah. be perfect uh, error his word yeah is without error yeah and he quotes uh, Don Carson, who says that um, inspiration is the supernatural work of God's Holy Spirit upon the human authors of Scripture, such that they wrote that what they wrote was precisely what God intended them to write in order to communicate His truth. Uh, so, when we get to the Word, every word and even like the verbal tense of that word is like exactly what God desired to be written in his word. Sure. Um, he gives some clarifications about inerrancy that I think is really helpful because sometimes this can be pretty confusing. Yeah. He says inerrancy is ascribed to the autographs, meaning the original text, not to the copies of the Bible. We respect historical process and value textual criticism because textual variants are undergirded by an inerrant original text. So, I mean, that's a textual criticism is a whole other thing, but I mean, we, we have firm confidence that the Bible that we have is is the word that was originally given, yeah. right? And there's a lot of reasons we can go into that. But what he's saying is, you will sometimes see in a footnote, you know, some manuscripts say this. Right. He He's saying, yeah, that that is a essentially a copying... I don't know if you want to say error or, or a copying complication that has existed through the years because of different manuscripts, just because there are some manuscripts that say a few different things, and it is a few, it's not a lot, doesn't mean that the Bible is errant. It doesn't mean it has errors. It means some of those textual copies have different. We're talking about the original copy. Correct. The original copy that Mark wrote, the original copy that Luke wrote. You know, um, Those are without error but there's strong reason to believe what we have today is what they wrote then and the small number of um statements or sentences that we don't know about they usually point out in a footnote um he says inerrancy is rooted in the belief that the bible is simultaneously a human book and the word of god Uh, therefore we prize the human aspects of the bible these aspects do not diminish the Bible's truthfulness, but show that God uses real people in a historical context to write to real people with real needs. The biblical authors write in ordinary form and style, and as such, there are certain things not required for inerrancy. So here's a list that's not required. Inerrancy does not expect Scripture's adherence to modern rules of grammar or spelling. Right? So, you know, sometimes if you read the originals, the grammar seems a little mixed up. Well, that's your view as a 21st century Westerner. Right. That doesn't mean it has errors. Or in it. you read any of Paul's writings and it You're lasts like, like nine verses, and it's like, that is a run on sentence. That's sentences. a run on sentence there, buddy. Yeah. Um, two, inerrancy is compatible with figurative language in various literary genres. You know, I, I one time heard, um, and you can get this can be dangerous, but w- we should interpret scripture literarily, not literally. And what the person meant by that was when it's a hyperbole, we need to interpret it as a hyperbole. Yes. So when Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, that's a hyperbole. Right. <laughs> he is not literally calling you to gouge your eye out if you ever lust upon a woman, you know? Right. But he's making a hyperbole to say, go to any length to keep your eyes pure. You right. Know? So we interpret it that way. Um, Another one, he says, inerrancy does not expect the technical language of modern science. I, I think a good example of this is, um, you know, uh, Scripture will also often speak of like the four corners of the earth. Right. And people say, see, the Bible has errors. Well, that's like a figurative. It is. We still kind of use that. Uh, yeah. It's figurative language. Yeah. It, that, that's not saying the Bible taught a flat earth. Right. You know, it it's so you shouldn't expect the Bible to speak with twenty first century scientific terms. Right. Um so yeah, I, I think some of those uh things that uh what inerrancy is not is is helpful. 
Um, but scripture is inerrant. It is without error. Um, so we've seen that scripture is inspired. It's God's word. It's authoritative. It's inerrant. And then fifth, it is sufficient. Uh, he says, God's word provides all that his people need to gain eternal life and to live godly lives. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us a very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. I think this is so helpful, and I think this truth can be a challenge to the excesses of the charismatic movement, the the sufficiency of Scripture, meaning sometimes we can chase experiences, yep. and we think, okay, what I need is this new experience, or I need this new thing. And what the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture is saying is, no, Scripture is all that you need to become a Christian and grow as a Christian. And that's reassuring. What was it that there was a maybe one of the Reformers or Jonathan Edwards or something said, like, if, if someone says something that is against Scripture, it's wrong. And if someone, like, prophesies something that is in line with Scripture, it's not necessary. Or something, right? It's sure. like it's enough, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, it reminds me of something that C.S. Lewis said, too, which is, I believe in Christianity as the sun has risen, not just because I see it, but by it I see everything else. Yeah. And that's the Word of God, right? Yep. It's like it explains so much of the world, and it tells us how to live. It gives us everything we need mm-hmm. to live a godly life, and not just a godly life, but one that— protects us and leads us to uh, a fulfilled life as well. Sure. Uh, it, it eventually leading into eternity unified with Christ. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so the Bible is sufficient. Six, the Bible is clear. Uh, he says, God so reveals himself in Scripture that as God's people, we are able to understand its basic message. This is called the clarity or perspicuity of Scripture. Um, now, he says it's obvious that uh, believers, we can only read the Bible with God's help. We need the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Uh, this is God's illumination of his word. Illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit to enable people to understand, believe, and apply Scripture. Um, the same Spirit who inspires the word of God works in us so that we can embrace its message. I think this is really helpful because one, one thing that you can hear a lot, people sometimes throw their arms up and say, well, you know, no one really knows what it means. Right. I heard a, a pastor one time, or I heard of a pastor one time, talking about uh, one of the more confusing parables of Jesus. And he said, I read a bunch of commentaries on this, and uh, no one really knows what this means. And, you know, I think... I think the main takeaway from this passage is, you know, God's a mystery. And I'm like, you should be fired immediately. (laughs) Uh, That is not the main takeaway of this passage. And sure, there are confusing things about Scripture. There are doctrines that good Christians debate, right? Do you baptize the baby or not, right? And and we'd say there's— there's kind of shades of clarity, but in its main message, the, the gospel of Christ, the need for sinners to be reconciled to God and to be saved through faith in Christ, it's clear. Yeah. And so, so we don't approach Scripture being like, I can never understand what this means. Yeah. By the Holy Spirit, you can. And the Holy Spirit aspect is important, too. I just want to point out the irony that in uh, the systematic theology you just read— he was talking about how clear and simple the scripture was, but then used a word like perpiscuity, which I don't know what that means. You know, it's like... I think it means clear, but it's what smart people say. It's like, can't you have made that more clear right. and simple <laughs> in your systematic theology? Um, couldn't, you, couldn't you have made that more perpiscuous? <laughs> right. Uh, I remember when I was in college, you know that verse that says, J- Jesus is saying, you know, I, I've I've not come to heal the healthy, but the sick. Sure. I remember reading that 
tons of times when I was a kid and through high school and stuff. And it just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks when I was like 20. Oh my gosh, I'm sick. And you might be like, yeah. duh, but it wasn't duh to me. Yeah, It was like, this is why you need the Holy Spirit. Cause you know, I just always viewed like, oh, that's someone else. You know, it's like Jimmy you know, sick people. in my yeah. class. You know? I wish like, he heard this. Yeah. yeah. And then it was like, oh my gosh, it's me. That's me. Yeah. And it became clear to me where it was muddy before. Yeah. And it's because, it, and it's like kind of that working together with the Holy Spirit, working together with the word of God mm-hmm. to make it clear to you. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, part of it is uh, when we come to the scripture, sometimes it is like we have scales on our eyes. It's not that the scripture is unclear it's that our vision is unclear and right that sometimes the it seems unclear to us but it's not because of the word we're reading it's because yeah. of the eyes we're reading it through mm-hmm. and the holy spirit needs to make our eyes clear so we can actually see the clarity coming through the scriptures that's good that's good yeah so the the scripture is clear and and that's a that's a reassurance to us that you like you really by the power of the holy spirit you really can understand what the bible means um, especially on the the broad main themes of the scripture. Of course, we're going to have some disagreements when we get to Revelation and you know right. in, interpretation of things. But scripture is clear enough for all that we need for for godliness. And then finally, so we've seen scripture is inspired. It's God's word. It's authoritative. It's inerrant. It's sufficient. It's clear. And finally, it's beneficial. Um, and he lists uh, four different ways that Scripture is beneficial. Uh, first, it alone brings the message of salvation, as Timothy learned at a young age, right? Second Timothy 3.15, you know that from infancy you have known the sacred Scriptures and are able to give, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's a pretty big benefit. Uh, scriptures will lead you to Christ. Um, Number two, God uses Scripture to equip pastors for their ministries. Uh, He said, God inspired his word so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Moreover, the pastor's main task is to minister God's word to God's people. Right? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, correct, encourage with great patience and teaching. So Scripture is, you know, if you're at a church where your pastor is feeding you something other than scripture, you should start looking, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, that's the you know, pastor's job yeah. is to feed the flock with the word. Uh, third, scripture is God's antidote to the poison of false teaching. Um, so, you know, how do you know, you know, where you're straying? Well, you get in the word. I mean, you mentioned this in a sermon um, a few weeks ago, like, you know, how do counterfeiters learn what counterfeits are? Well, they study the real thing. And they know the real thing so well that they can spot a fake. Yeah, uh, it's same with false teaching, right? Is is you're you're warned against it um, through the scriptures. And then fourth, the Bible is God's main tool to help His people grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Um, right, Second Timothy three sixteen. It's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so, um, it's uh, scripture is beneficial. Yeah, for those things. And he, he ends uh, this chapter, it's worth quoting, he says, Psalm 119, the Bible's longest chapter, is filled with ways that God uses his word to benefit us. Scripture produces reverence for God, purifies, strengthens, comforts, and gives life, hope, discernment, wisdom, understanding, and guidance. God's word is beneficial in that it prompts us such attitudes, that it prompts in us such attitudes toward the word as longing, delight, love, and fear. In addition, it elicits meditation, obedience, joy, rejoicing, hope, and gratitude to God. The priceless value of God's word compels us to echo the words of the psalmist. Open my eyes that I might contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. Uh, Instruction from your lips is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Lord, your word is forever. It is firmly fixed in heaven. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey on my mouth. I rejoice over your promise like one who finds vast treasure. So, yeah, Psalm 119 is is the right place to go to think about mm. the Bible. Um, so that's that's our overview of bibliology. Uh, Scripture is inspired, God's Word, authoritative, inerrant, sufficient, clear, and beneficial. 
Um, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I think just e- even in doing this podcast, just reminded of two quotes. One from Spurgeon, you know, someone asked him, mm. what would you, how would you defend the Bible? Yeah. I'm, I'm probably misquoting a little bit. I'm going to give a summary. Yep. And he said, defend the Bible. I will sooner defend a lion, unleash it, it will defend itself. Yeah. And in the same line, uh, you know, the Bible tells us, you know, about God, like taste, uh, taste and see, right? Yeah. And if you're someone listening to this podcast who maybe isn't convinced, mm-hmm. oh, you know what? Two guys talking about some stuff about the Bible. <laughs> Read it. Yeah. We're, we're not, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I can't convince you. I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't have any false notions of myself that I think I can. Yeah. Go read it. Yeah. Go taste. Yep. And see if the Lord is good. Yeah. And that would be my advice. That's a good word. Unleash it. Unleash yeah. it. Go go read the Bible and actually try to do what it says. Yep. And see if your life doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'd say, you know, as we look at um, just the perfections of God's Word, we do have to realize, as uh, I believe it was uh, Peter Parker's uncle that told him, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> You know, I mean, the, the first Christians, they they did not live in a world where they could have a, a Bible on their phone. They, they, they didn't have individual copies of the Bible. Um, I mean, it, it's just such recent history that widespread uh, masses can read and the printing press make, making it available, you know— um, to have for ourselves, I, we just live in a unique time in history, and and sadly, so many we have a bunch of Bibles in our houses, and off, they often collect dust. Um, so don't neglect the the beauty of having God's Word in your language at your fingertips, and um, so get in it. You know, read it, meditate it, meditate on it, memorize it, study it, uh, hear it preached. Um, let let the Bible. Uh, change your life. So, um, yeah, that'd be my closing thoughts. So that's Bibliology. Next week, we'll be back to talk about theology or theology proper, and we'll talk about the Trinity. Uh, but before we close, we got to go with our resource of the month. Uh, what's yours? So before we go th- through the resource of the month, I just have to say, I got some feedback about our last life hack of the month from two weeks ago. Oh yeah. About how I contradicted your your life hack about the drinks from Panera that Brittany <laughs> gave you. And some people thought, man, you said to me like, I thought you were being kind of mean to Brittany. And I just want to <laughs> publicly say that was not my intention in and in, to say, Brittany, I love you. That was a great life hack. <laughs> I just thought it would be funny to contradict exactly what Justin just said. So it was it was more about me being pl- playfully mean to Justin than it was. I, I, I didn't even think about it. So if anyone took it that way, Brittany, I thought that was great. A great life hack. And sorry if it came off a different way. It's, uh, it's nice of you to fall on your sword, but I'm going to take it out of your torso and thrust it into my own. Uh, <laughs> I'm the one that said, we, we were planning the podcast, and I was like, all right, I'm going to do Britney's life hack. I know you hate Panera. I think it would be funny for your life hack to be <laughs> anti-Panera. So, yeah, there, there was no, um, no uh, planned harm here. It was, uh, it was just banter. Yeah, we, we just thought it would be fun banter. So yeah. just wanted to clear, clear that up. But my resource of the month is a podcast called Who Killed JFK, made by Rob Reiner. He's the one that, I don't know if he produced or directed – What's that movie with Inigo Montoya? Mm, sorry. The Princess Bride. The Princess ah. Bride. Yes. Uh, and so he's, he's a filmmaker. And, you know, he grew up, he, he was, you know, maybe a teenager when JFK was assassinated. And it's all about who killed JFK. And it is fantastic. It's yeah. well done. It'll make you think in a different way. And it'll, like, make you start asking questions about the world we live in. And it is, I've told some people about it and met Multiple people have already um, listened to it and agree with where they landed, and that's where I landed. I'm, I don't want to spoil anything, mm. but I would say if you're looking for a podcast, it's a little conspiracy theory-ish. If you like history, good storytelling, this is a podcast for you. 
yeah, you you got me into it, and it's great. It's like ten episodes. Yeah, so ten it's not, forty minute you know, episodes. Um, it's it's really well done, and I've I've kind of I'm not a conspiracy guy, but I, I bought into this one. I'm like, there's enough here that this is not yeah. what they told us it was. Yes. Yeah. So I yeah, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, my resource of the month is a book called Biblical Critical Theory by Christopher Watkin. Um, and it's not the actor that talks. I can't do his voice. But it's not Christopher Walken. What? <laughs> right. This is, if you're wondering, wow, more, he more wrote cowbell. a cowbell. Yeah. 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 He, he wrote a book. Yeah. Wow. wow. I didn't know he was a Christian. <laughs> um, yeah. Christopher Watkin. And it's also when you hear critical theory, you you often jump to like critical race theory or it, it's not that. It's critical theory is more about like how to view the world, like you view the world from from this critical questioning point. And so what he does, it's it's basically a book on almost like biblical theology and systematic theology. So he takes like like we just did bibliology. He'll take a chapter on that, on, on the inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible, and he'll both teach that, and then he'll show how we should use that to correct our own culture. Mm. And sh- so he goes through basically all the Bible. K- kind of like this podcast, like the purpose of this podcast, yeah. right? Like how to take what you know to actually apply it in the world. Yeah. Man, but that's I mean, great. He's, he's quoting every philosopher you could ever imagine that had any significance in the last several hundred years. I mean, it is... Man, I might have to buy this book. It is astounding. It, it's, it is um, longer than I expected it to be when I bought it. So just a heads up, like, it's, it's a long read, and it's, it's a hard read. Like, it, it's, it takes mental effort to get through. But if you're looking um, to help, like, maybe your own self, as you realize maybe you've been, like, overly influenced by the world... Uh, this would be a good book. Or if you're looking to grow in your, like, apologetics and your understanding of, like, how to speak of the Bible to the culture around you, this is um, top-notch. So uh, basically he takes his cue from Augustine in The City of God where he basically critiques Roman society, at the city of man, with the city of God. It's kind of his version of this, and it's, uh, it's a masterpiece, but it is not easy. So it, it took me quite a while huh. to get through. And I got stuck and gave up for a few months and then came back. Um, but highly recommend it. Well, thanks for joining us for part one of Ologies, Bibliology. We'll be back next week to talk about theology proper. <laughs>